103 my time. So we're going to get started because I want you guys to all meet Laura. Hi, Angela. Hi, Good Angela. You. So um, let me tell you a little bit about Laura. I'm really excited to have her here. Um, Laura Rotter is a CFA and CFP and founder of True Abundance Advisors, a fiduciary fee only financial planning firm. You were trying to make that into one of those things, fee only financial planning firm. <laughs> for people navigating big life transitions and preparing for the next chapter of their lives. Laura believes that the accumulation of wealth is only part of the financial planning process and that true abundance comes from learning how to employ that wealth to do the things you most value. After a successful career managing money for institutional investors, including Citicorp and Para Advisors, Laura now partners with clients to achieve both financial security and life satisfaction. She has been featured on CNBC, The Wall Street Journal, and Westchester Senior Voice, and is on the advisory, advisory council of Impact 100 Westchester, a women's group giving organization and the investment committee of the Hebrew, Hebrew Free Burial Association. That's interesting. And so Laura's so lovely to have joined us. And hi, Donna, good to have you guys here. So Laura, I'm gonna let you go right in. Um, and I know you had some questions you wanted people to put into the chat box. So I'll let you do with that. Sure, so first I'll, I'll watch the chat for you. Share my screen. Let's see where I can move you guys so I can move it forward. So first of all, Leslie, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, Leslie uh, and our team chose this name, which I love. I really love this topic, speaks to my heart. And I also want to say how much I enjoy being with the wonderful women from Kobe Club, having spent a great deal of my life um, surrounded by men. I do not take for granted the um, the welcoming of groups of women, the openness to share. And um, I look forward from all of us learning from each other, not um, just me teaching. Um, and we're small enough, guys. I think we're small enough group that if you have something to say, you can just pop in and Laura knows um, you'll do that. Or you can put it in the chat and um, I'm happy to ask it for you in the chat, whatever you want. But exactly. we're small enough today. Either one. So I'd like to take this first moment to invite everyone to get present. Um, presence, I think, is a big part of, of our journey towards change. Mm -hmm. So if your legs are crossed, just, just for a moment, you can uncross your legs and feel your feet on the ground. And take a deep breath in. And let it go and arrive. I know some of you may have rushed to get here. So just invite yourself to be here in this space for the next hour. And it's my intention really to use this time to create a safe space. So um, know that if you feel moved to share anything that it of course will be held by all of us in confidentiality and that none of us is trying to uh, fix or solve we're all here just to listen to each other with uh, compassion and curiosity. So I'd love to get an idea of um, why you signed up for this webinar. Um, if you could share uh, what about the name of this webinar spoke to you. I'll jump in. Um, the reason that I signed up is because I recently left a uh, executive uh, role at a um, public company that I'd been in for 30 years. Oh, wow. And I left, actually um, resigned without a plan for what I'm going to do next. And I'm searching for um, ideas to reinvent myself. And I happen to find Leslie's uh, podcast. I listen to it every day when I walk my dogs. Yeah. And I've learned so much and been so inspired. Yeah, so I came to your Covey Club. I'm trying to join it. I can't, I'm having a hard time with the website. So I signed up yesterday for one of your sessions. And I'm back today, but I do need to join so that I can participate um, more fully. And that's what I'm here for, to learn and grow. 
Awesome. Trouble with the website. Marissa, you have to help. <laughs> out. Yeah, I need some help because I tried to, I've, I can only figure out how to sign up as a guest. So oh, I'm nice. having difficulty signing up for, I think it's called Nest. Yeah, I'm, you're, I'm, not, I'm having difficulty getting to the place where I actually pay. Okay, we got it. We're in the process of updating some of the systems. It could be partly that. So Marissa, okay. afterwards, we'll work with you. Thank you for letting me know. You don't yeah, no find out, you know, until yeah, yeah. So, so I'm not done I'm that... contributing to life. I'm trying to figure out what, how, how, and where, and when I'm going to do that. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Donna. And that's uh, really a very brave step that you've taken. Scary. Um, if you're interested in sharing, um, you know, we've all come through this strange year. And is there something you've learned about yourself or about the environment this year that you're taking forward? You know, this year being 2020 that just passed that you're taking forward and you'd like to share? Are you asking me? I am, Donna, because oh, she would okay, great sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yes, what I learned is that I do not want to be stuck in a um, career that I'm doing just for money, for the salary, right? And the benefits, but I wanna do something that's more um, true to my heart. And I learned this through COVID because I've always been in sales and marketing and leadership. And when COVID hit, I had to start working from home and I wasn't around my network. I wasn't able to entertain and do the sexy things that went along with my job. And I learned that I do not want, I'm not a desk person, do not wanna be behind a desk ever. And um, I just learned that I, I want to go in a different direction in my career and use my marketing, sales, and leadership skills in a different way to help other people to, I'm not sure, but I, I couldn't do it another day. And so I quit. And my husband supported me 100%. Wow. Yeah. Cut our income in half. Wow. Yeah. Sounds so. very familiar to me. That's what I learned from COVID <laughs> is that I'm not moving forward, not doing what my heart feels appropriate um actually i went I'm, I'm testing how these slides move would anybody before i go on to the next slide would anyone else like to share and leslie if you see because i don't have the full yeah depth. yeah yeah. go ahead and jump in guys we're a small group today if anybody else wants to share well hey this is suzanne so um so the, the topic really spoke to me because um i i i left a corporate position and actually the year after that, it was like the happiest year of my life. And, um, you know, trying to get, you know, trying to get something going. We talk a lot about um, starting, you know, new businesses. And most of the time, the first thing you try isn't necessarily exactly right. And, you know, I found that to be true, even though I enjoyed what I was doing. We decided to move back home, if you will, across the country. That took my attention. And I ended up um, kind of taking this, this job that I wasn't exactly sure what it'd be like, but... I've worked with the person before, you know, two corporations ago, I've been a client of the person. I thought, well, you know, I mean, I can, you know, give this a whirl. And, and really it's just like it's stressing me out to no end and I don't like it. And, um, you know, but you know, gosh, the money just keeps rolling. And I mean, I'm shaving money off and throwing it in a savings account. I'm like, oh, well, this is kind of cool. You know, so, uh, you know, there's that old joke, right? And the punchline is, We've already determined what you are. Now we're just negotiating price. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I get that, you know, but I really, I really would, and, 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 and I'm not poor, you know, I'm not rich. Karen, I mean, look, I know a lot of super rich people. I'm nowhere in their league, but I also know average people and I'm way beyond their league. So I'm not in dire straits, but I, and, and I'm really compelled to, to do things well and, and, and be successful and have wins. And I think that's what's killing me in this job. It's like, there's just no winning. And so, um, you know, I'm really struggling with, and I, I commitment's my number one value. I don't like the idea that this very tiny company with this person I've had a long standing relationship with, that I would be kind of letting them down going, yeah, you know what? I don't think I can really do this, can I go? So I've just really been struggling. And so I'm, I'm, you know, really open to ways to think about things and how to kind of process all that and, you know, decide whether I'm being a prima donna or whether I've got a real point here and I need to make a real change. Thank you so much for sharing that, Suzanne. And, uh, and we did center at the beginning specifically to build the muscle to hear that your inner voice and to start trusting that inner voice. Um, and it sounds like you're hearing it and evaluating whether, whether or not to trust it. Um, 
So I just put this slide in, this quote from Howard Thurman, which I love and has been a quote that I've turned to through my journey over the last decade. Um, you know, we're, we're, we grow up taught to like, what box do you want to fit yourself in? And that is not the question to be asking ourselves. The question is what makes us come alive? That is what the world is asking of us. That is what life is asking of us. And um, to get quiet enough to hear that voice and to trust that voice is, you know, frankly, our life's work. Um, so I'll share my story uh, briefly. I always like to make the joke that I had a 30 year career on Wall Street, but I started when I was 15. Um, and I really see that career in thirds. The first 10 years were amazing. I did interesting work. I was paid well for that work. Um, I was sort of the nerdy kid in high school. So suddenly I had a career that I felt outwardly represented how successful I was, and in some ways was, you know, what I needed to see as a young person. And so I loved what I did for the first 10 years. I was an analyst on Wall Street, got to know different industries, got to meet different people. The second 10 years, I was far and away the primary breadwinner of my family. My husband's a physician, but he's, he stepped back to work part-time and it was a blur. I have three kids, Don't I'll talk to you offline how the age difference between the youngest and the oldest is two years. So though I was the one who came home to them bathed in their pajamas, it was a busy household for quite a long time. So I didn't question what I did. The last 10 years, I have to say were just misery. I had to be on a trading desk at 7 a.m. with a bunch of guys whose values I didn't share. They were all divorcing their wives and marrying young wives. It was, and I was trapped by the life I had put in place. I had a large 6,000 square foot home. I had a vacation home. I had three kids in private school. We took fancy vacations and, um, I, it took mindfulness practices. I found yoga. I actually took a yoga teacher training. I started to meditate. And it sounds so simple, but I suddenly wake up to this, woke up to this idea that you only get one life. There ain't no do-overs. <laughs> you know, if you're getting up every day and putting on a tight pair of shoes and clutching and clawing your way to the weekend when you can be yourself. You're choosing that life, Laura. I was choosing to be a victim and it occurred to me that I could make a different choice. And we'll, in, in future slides, we'll get on like specifics of this, but I sold my big house and I sold my vacation home. And the time was right, I had paid for college, my kids were off the payroll and um, I made a different decision. Uh, but as I, as I pointed out earlier, when, um, when you spoke, it, it does take bravery. It's not like you snap your fingers and then you're into this next great life. But, you know, life was calling to me and, and I, I had to answer. Um, I put this slide in uh, because I have made my mission. So I, I, I moved from institutional Wall Street to now working with individuals. And my mission is working with individuals who are either already in a big life transition or are moving towards a big life transition and to work on both aspects of money. Of course, the technical part of money, but there's no time when money changes that your life doesn't change. And conversely, when you make a personal life change, uh, a marriage ends, a career changes, that is gonna have an impact on the numbers and um, the two go hand in hand. And so I'm, I'm a member of the Financial Transitionist Institute um, where again, we are privileged to work primarily with people who are undergoing a big change in their lives. So defining your why, this is the you know, over-mentioned Simon Sinek quote, but it's really important. Um, if the only reason you're contemplating making a change is because you're running away from something, I find that that's a lot tougher than if you feel yourself pulled 
towards something else. My first analogy, I'm, I am a big exerciser. I had a friend who said, how do you get yourself out of bed every, every morning to exercise? And I said, I'm not pushing myself out of bed. I'm excited, I'm pulled towards you know, the exercise I'm doing. Um, I find the people I work with that um, have the most successful transitions are those who understand why that change is taking place. What are they moving towards? Um, the quote here, it's not logic or facts, but our hopes and dreams, our hearts and our guts that drive us to try new things. So on the next two slides, um, I'm sharing exercises that I do with people I work with, help them start to identify what's calling to them. Um, so I wanna take a um, minute or two here to read these questions out loud and give you a moment or so to, to sit on them and, uh, and if anyone feels moved to share. So I, I call this investing your time and energy because of course people pick up the phone and call me thinking, you know, I have an inheritance, what do I do with this money? But we have two scarce resources as, as everyone on this call is aware. And certainly as this year has made so many more of us aware, our time is a, is a scarce resource. And we're always trading off one for the other, our time for money, our money for time. And so it's important to consider how do you want to invest your time in the coming years? So thinking back over your lifetime, what accomplishments have given you the greatest intrinsic rewards and why? And I, I'm smiling the next question, what activities paid or unpaid currently make you feel good, to use that word from the Howard Thurman quote, that make you feel alive, that make you feel that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It could be gardening, it could be exercising, it could be spending time with your children, but to sit and identify what are those activities and what activities currently give your life a sense of meaning and purpose. Um, we really are of the age where we understand this. I've asked this of my of my uh, 25 year old son, and he felt like I was putting too much pressure on him, you know. But I think when you're 25 years old, you're not really sure, you know, what that means. But but we know what that means. What does give us a sense of meaning and purpose? And then sometimes a harder question to answer, what are some of the things you would like to accomplish or experience in the future? And again, not tying this to a certain amount of money that you would earn doing this, but just dreaming if, if, you, know, if you didn't have to think about you know, the money, what would you want to experience or accomplish? So if anyone, if this speaks to anyone or you'd like to share. Um, Anybody want to share there? Just jump in to any of those answers. I know some of you have answers. I can tell. I know all of you really well. Angela, Angela, come on. And Suzanne's muted. I see lips moving, but it could be. So talking. I can talk about sure. um, some of them. I think the activities that make me feel good, um, I think it's, it's hard because they're all activities that are centered on me doing things for other people, um, which is probably common, for, I think, for a lot of women. So um, it would be things like helping out my friends or spending time with my son, um, things that I can't necessarily build a career out of, um, and things that I feel like I don't have enough time to do. So um, that is what I think gave me pause and let me realize that those are, those are actually the really super important things for me. And maybe it's like my, lab, those are my labors of love that I don't get paid for, but that I enjoy doing, so. 
how I make that all work and still have health insurance, I've got no idea. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's beautiful that what makes you feel good is, is giving of yourself and your time to others. Anybody else? I, I think I'm unmuted now. Yep. Um, so like a couple of things, I mean, the things that, that when I look back at, at accomplishments, it's, it's where I led something that had a great outcome, right? So either, you know, marketing campaigns that either delivered above or beyond the um, expected results, or we won awards, or then other pieces when individuals have told me, you know, the work I did when I was working for you was the best work I've ever done. Like okay. that, that means a lot. Um, not getting any of that right now, but, <laughs> but I have had it in the past. And, you know, so what I, what, what really makes me feel good is whenever I'm, you know, designing something um, and designing, not just in a, the artistic sense, although I do have that, but just, you know, figuring out what it needs to be in order to drive the outcomes and success that everyone wants. I, I love doing that. And then, you know, when I think about the things, you know, one of the things I've toyed around with is I've gotten really interested, I've, well, I've always been really interested in human behavior. And of course, as a marketer, that's a key piece, right? You, the idea is you're influencing others to act in your best interest. So um, understanding how people work, it's fascinating to me. There's some really interesting work being done in behavioral economics. Um, love the stuff like Dan Aureli at Duke is doing. Um, you know, so if I were dreaming, I'd be like, oh, could I work with those people? <laughs> like, I think that would be fun. Mm -hmm. Right. What I'm hearing, Suzanne, is that you like to problem solve. Um, and I'm also hearing that you like to work in teams and um, maybe motivate others to, to work at their, um, at their highest. Um, when I look at these questions, I think of, of looking at the events that give us a sense of accomplishment and then perhaps looking behind them to see, you know, what are the pieces that are contributing to that sense of accomplishment. Um, it's wonderful, though, when you're able to identify it. And Leslie, you can feel free to share as well. Um. <laughs> sure, sure. No, I was gonna. I was gonna say what's really interesting um, after studying so many women in the podcast and more magazine was a lot about reinvention as well. Is that um, once you understand what drives you, and it took me a while to figure out what the thread was between all the magazines I ran and what I was gonna do next. <clears throat> there was a very interesting woman. She was the Dean of Students at Duke who used to do this thing. And some of you may have been on a call where I talked about this, but she used to do this event called What's Your Question? And then when I first went into this, I was like, what is this stupid, like, <laughs> my question? I don't have any questions, I want answers. I'm a snarky pain in the butt. Anyway, the most interesting thing was she was a researcher, sociologist. And what she's pointed out and showed you was that if you really dig down into questions like this and you really write it out and you look back at what you did in the past, and especially for women, you can find a through line, a through line in the form of a question that you have been working on your whole life. For me, I was able to identify when she said that, it was like, what holds magazines and Covey Club together? I don't know, I'm just doing it. It was, how can I help other women be their best selves? And that was a question I was trying to solve because when my mother divorced my father, she kind of fell apart and I couldn't help her. And look, it ended up being my trajectory for life. I didn't know that, but when I really look back and say, oh, okay, you know, I couldn't solve her problem, but I can solve problems for many other people. You know, I'm cool with that. It's okay. It came from a, a wacky place. A lot of, a lot of times, a lot of times of our initial motion motivations come from maybe that's not something so great. But what's wonderful is that it can provide you once you understand it and you take away the old pain and suffering of that and you say, how do I use it? It still gives me great joy. And um, you just if you if you look back and keep asking yourself, what is your question? And it sounds really stupid and simple. 
But and you keep writing that down and say, what is my question? What is my question? And then look at all your jobs and everything you did. There might be a question that you have been trying to answer or solve for a very long time. It's just interesting. I love that. And um, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I certainly see the through line, mm -hmm. what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. These and Leslie, your through line didn't stop anywhere. <laughs> I've, I've found my line has kind of stopped. And know what I used to love to do in my career as an event planner? I absolutely loved the things I accomplished then, and then my career changed. And I'm not really satisfied in the job I have now. It has no projects, no beginning, no end. I think I heard someone say that. So I find satisfaction in my art. However, there's a million starving artists out there. And when that, I see that third question of, of, you know, what else, where would that lead you? I, I, my line stops. I haven't, I don't know how to make the connection about what I love to do then to make money and what I love to do now to relax. I What's the next step to find how to weave those two together? I bet you can find a connection, right, Laura? Those are the kind of, I think those are the kind of things that you can find the connection when you start digging. You probably need, you know, a little coaching in there, I'm guessing, but I think that to me, that would be, I know there's answers there. We're not motivated, in my opinion, having done 25 years of psychotherapy myself. Um, I've seen questions where I see, I've seen, you know, answers and questions and motivations where I originally thought there were none when you really get somebody to help you figure it out. And sometimes, you know, we can do that through coaching or whatever, sometimes through groups, right. but you got to find a way to connect those Tammy because you can be, but I understand that. I think part of the problem and, and Laura, I don't know if your clients at, at talk about this, this digital age is killing people like me and probably like Tammy, where we like to have projects that were done. And, you know, and I can see with your painting, Tammy, because I watch you and I love, I love where you're going with your painting. I love, I'm watching Tammy, pro, you know, like progress <laughs> in her painting. And um, that tangibility is a really difficult thing in this world that we're living in. My son's suffering the same way is that he's, you know, a tech, tech guy and nothing's ever done. You're always on the wheel, nothing finishes, nothing ends. Whereas magazines were very tangible. I could put it up on the wall, it would end up on my desk. You know, when you do an event, the event happens, it's over, you get accolade. There's, you know, there's something about the old way of doing business that we're missing today, which creates a, a sense of less satisfaction. Oh, just muted. Um, and I guess I want to add a sort of a different framework to Tammy's question, which is, um, as, as I've learned on this journey, which is the key is to just try it out and, put, you know, take a chance, try something that may not be the thing, um, but to keep moving forward and trying and being willing to fail and learn from you know what that failure is, and then try something else, um, because we're constantly evolving. The world is constantly evolving, and what you might think is like that perfect through line, you may be doing something a little bit different the year after, um, and not to feel like you have to know now. Um, I, I read Mark Nepo every morning. He's a poet and he has an entry for each day. And he had a recent entry where we, we approach our lives like a puzzle, like what's the next piece? Where do I need that piece? And actually, if we could just relax and let go, our lives are a song and, you know, just be willing to see, sing it and, you know, maybe be off key. Um, it's very hard for us culturally to do that, but it's, uh, it's a, a different, it's a way to reframe this journey we're on. Um, I'm gonna share these questions from George Kinder that I also use in my practice with clients. Uh, George Kinder is a Buddhist and known as the father of financial life planning. And um, he's known for these three questions asked in progression, a little wow. tough. Um, the first question is, you're financially secure. 
you have enough money to take care of your needs now and into the future. How would you live your life? What would you do with that money? What would you change? Mm. I'll ask all three like I did before and then let us sit with them a bit. So the second question is your doctor tells you have five to 10 years left to live. You're gonna feel fine during those five 10 to 10 years. You're not gonna feel sick. On the other hand, you, you have no idea when, when it's going to be your last day. So what will you do in the time you have remaining? Will you change your life and how? And then the final question is, um, your doctor tells you that you've got one day left to live. You have 24 hours. What dreams will be left unfulfilled? What do you wish you had done? And what did you miss? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm happy to share these slides with you afterwards, but I, I, I find these are these elicit more thoughtful responses than what are your goals for the next 10 years, which, you know, often, uh, you know, that kind of question just gets sort of blank stares. Um, this is... Uh, Laura, do you find that during COVID this got more real? Because I, I feel like that, that, I don't know how other people saw it, but I saw it as, okay, I can be dead in two weeks. Like, you see that happen with COVID. It came right to your doorstep. The normal people, healthy people, you didn't do anything to deserve this thing. You could be out of here. And it just brought that, you know, right to your right to your doorstep and like, you know, this is not a dress rehearsal. Do you hear that from your clients? It really depends on the client. Um, I, I think people who are in touch it's my, my quick answer is not necessarily that much more. What I have seen from clients though, especially because everyone's working right now from home, mm -hmm. a lot more wi willingness to reimagine the next couple of years of their lives. Cause they've been home, they've spent time with their kids. They've seen that maybe, you know, who needs the fancy car? They're not taking it out of their driveway or who needs the, you know, the house in, I'm in a suburb of New York City, it's relatively expensive. Do I have to be in a suburb of New York City? I'm speaking to more and more people that are questioning basic building blocks of their lives that they wouldn't have questioned before. But I think open to the idea of your own mortality. Um, some people are and some people aren't. Mm -hmm. Anybody here find that the mortality question came up? in during COVID or maybe it was just me. Maybe I'm gonna speak for myself. I, I, I lost both my parents over the last oh, couple of years and my father's girlfriend oh my. And, and COVID. And um, I, I feel like I am much more aware um, that again, live my life to the fullest. However, I wanna define that. Um, Suzanne, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, COVID didn't, I've been, again, I told you I was fascinated with human nature, but um, I, I was, I'm still like processing how people have been so highly tuned to the idea that something can happen to them. Because in my world, it was like, well, yeah, something could always happen to you. Like, that's new? No, that's always the same. <laughs> that's how I felt about that. Oh, really? um, I didn't feel that, I mean, disease, in and of itself, you know, early on, you're like, mm, I want to understand this better. Gee, how bad is this? I didn't come to a place where I was that too worried about it being as, you know, really super healthy as I am. What I will tell you has been more of a factor for me is just getting older. Um, my father's side of the family, longevity does not happen. My own parents were dead before they were 70. Yeah. So, you know, that's more of a okay, <laughs> this might, I might, I, I kind of think about this five to 10 years. I'm like, yeah, that could happen already. I could be there. <laughs> you yeah. know, I already think that. So, um, but that's just based on the people around me and how long they've lived. 
Exactly. That that is what I found. Thank you for sharing that, Suzanne. So if anyone wants to, before we go on, because I'm going to move from here into more of the technical side of you know money considerations as as you approach or are in a transition. So I'm going to change slides, but feel free if you want to bring this up after we go. Technical side. I put in the line reducing uncertainty to reduce fear because so many of us and women especially are like, I'm just not going to look, it'll be fine. And looking is what helps bring the blood pressure down, that brings clarity, that helps the decision making process. So fear is actually reduced by paying attention to the numbers as opposed to the other way around. So Here's some steps you can take if you're anticipating, perhaps like Suzanne, you're anticipating leaving a position. Um, first of all, making sure you have as big an emergency fund as you need. If, if you're continuing to work, you have a stable job, emergency fund should be like three months, maybe six months of spending. Can be more if you just like to see money in the bank account. But if you're anticipating, as I did, as, of you know, starting a new business that may take a while to be profitable, uh, as much of a cushion that you can have in the bank um, is recommended. And if you can have that high a cushion and you own a home, put a home equity line of credit in place while you still have pay stubs and an employer that can vouch for your employment. You don't necessarily need to draw it down, but much more affordable debt than credit card debt. And, um, and you're unlikely to get a home equity line of credit put in place once you're working for yourself and don't necessarily have the ability to show your income. And, um, and then of course, pay off all your high cost debt before you have a period where you're bringing in less money so that you're not paying high interest and accumulating credit card debt. This is true at any time in your life, but as you're anticipating a period of time of income uncertainty, um, just have a stable uh, financial picture as possible. So that's, that's heading into the transition. Also, have a clear understanding of how much your lifestyle costs. I mean, that, that I, I was horrified. <laughs> there was a period in my life, again, these are New York Wall Street numbers and I had kids around, that I had to earn $600,000 just to break even. Like it was horrifying <laughs> the expenses I had put in place. Um, and what I say to my clients now is pretend for the next month you're gonna lie in bed and watch Netflix. What, what, what are you paying for anyway? Like your rent has to be paid, your mortgage has to be paid, your Netflix bill has to be paid, your cell phone has to get paid, your lease or your, or your car loan. What are the things that you feel like you're not even spending any money um, and that you have to pay for? And ideally, and I'll talk about this in another slide, ideally that's not more than half of what you're bringing in each month. Um, because if it is, then there's less money for fun and less money for the cushion. So the first thing to do is just to look at all your recurring, you know what they are, monthly expenses. Interestingly, there are often expenses that go away when you're not working. Thought about it in COVID, it's fewer expenses. I mean, in my, when I was working, I had the monthly, you know, commuter rail pass and I had to have a car. So the parking permit and dry cleaning bills for the suits I was wearing and, you know, getting lunch in Midtown Manhattan, I never brown bagged. It was like 15 to 20 bucks a pie. I mean, all those things went away when I stopped working in, you know, my previous career. So just looking at what you're spending now that you may not be spending, you might not need a car and might not need a second car. What can you get rid of um, if you're no longer commuting and in your corporate job? Understanding your savings, um, looking at what you have accumulated, not only the emergency fund, but hopefully you have some money that's in investments. Um, and ideally you're not gonna draw that down in the per period of time, but if you do need to draw from that, 
rule of thumb in my industry that's debated all the time now because of low interest rates is you don't want to withdraw more than 4%. The idea being that over a long period of time, your investments will earn at least 4%. So you can keep the principal constant while taking some money out to support your lifestyle. But looking at what you have, and is, is that at all a possibility? Um, other sources of income I put on the right, but frankly, as you're looking at a transition, this is probably the one of the first things you consider. I'm not, I'm, I'm assuming most of you are, are not gonna suddenly stop working. Um, hopefully we'll all have long lives, notwithstanding our genetics. And I always assume everyone's gonna li live till at least 95. You don't wanna sit home and not be doing anything. Can you use your skills to work as a consultant? Or are there other roles you're drawn to, perhaps working in a nonprofit industry or something that will pay less, but you'd enjoy more? And where does that fit in? And if you have questions on any of this, please chime in. I'm going to go through this slide quickly. You know, will you need health insurance? Can you get on your spouse's plan? Um, will you consider relocating, which frankly, a number of my clients are starting to look at now? Um, the areas that have lower cost of living, and also who depends on you. And it's not only if you have kids that depend on you, but do your parents so depend on you for help? Do you have siblings that you know you help financially? Who is dependent on you, and do you have you know protection in place? I'm just going to chime in on lower cost of living. I never lived in a place that had a lower cost of living. I've been in New York for 40 years. And it's shocking. When you go somewhere, you take the cat to the vet, it's not $450, it's 125. And I'm standing there going, and? <laughs> and, and? And they're like, no, no, that's it. And you're like, with the blood test? The blood test is usually $400. I don't understand. <laughs> and you don't realize how, how you just took it all for granted that that was the way it was and there was no other possibility so it is an, it's an it, it i can also understand now why these young people can't migrate to a more expensive um standard of living but you know you can have a great life in other places and it's just i never knew that i mean i couldn't leave new york because i was in publishing there was no other place for publishing but it is a wonderful when you are at that moment it is something to think about and not just in terms of retirement or whatever, it's in terms of making your life easier. I'm like with you. I'm with you there. When I'd forgotten, I'd been in, in New York for, you know, 10 years and I'd forgotten when we moved back to Memphis and the first utility bill I got, I just giggled. I mean, it was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spent more to park my car in the city than that. <laughs> it's very, very true. I'd like to add that the um, reason I was able to actually uh, leave my job is because my husband and I sold our home in LA. We've been in LA our entire marriage, 30 years. And um, we are now living in a 1500 square foot home that we bought as a rental property in Palm Springs. And we love it. Minimalizing is amazing. So we um, took that leap and it's awesome. That is, that's awesome. That is way. Right now. No way. I'd be hustling. Yeah. And it's nice to not have that pressure, you know, mm. on you to it just, I mean, that it's wonderful. But Palm Springs is a great place to go. <laughs> with the downsize. I don't miss my old lifestyle. I do not miss it. Yeah, me either. So no, interesting. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the first thing I use with people who are just trying to understand what their overhead is, is put a mindful spending plan in place. We talked about having your recurring expenses 50% or less. And a big way of doing that is again, you know, I this the house I'm in now is half the size of the house I was in before and much more warm and nurturing. And, and this is like a spiritual home I moved into. Um, and it sounds like um, you also, Donna, have, have brought your expenses down. So one of the ways I do this, um, and it's sometimes hard for people because we're all addicted to the points of our credit cards, but just at least for a month or so, as an easy way to track 
how much you're spending on discretionary, come up with a number after you see what your fixed expenses are. And ideally maybe saying about 10% to 20%, I'm gonna pay myself first, I'm gonna put into a checking, a, a savings account. So what's left in the middle? I'm going to say round numbers. This may be high. This may be low. Let's say, okay, I've got an, I've got another, it's probably high, 4,000 I can spend for the month on discretionary. Divide it by four. So say, okay, 1,000 on discretionary. And uh, frankly, I, I do this just to track what I'm spending. I put that in a separate checking account. It's automated. And I can check the balance. So I can look, oh my God, by Wednesday, I've spent all of it on, on Whole Foods shopping and, and that shirt that was on sale, or I may have money left at the end of the week. But it is so much easier to track that way. We all have our apps on our phones. So you can immediately see what the balance is in that separate checking account, rather than saying, oh, once a month, I'm gonna take out my credit card bill and see what I spent on groceries and what I spent on shoes. And Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you spend the money on. You just wanna be aware of what you're spending. And because of the way most of us use, we have one checking account, everything comes in, everything goes out, we're putting everything on credit cards. We have no idea how much we're spending. And um, another thing I tell clients when we're doing this is that you can, if you see that you've spent the money and you wanna keep spending, transfer more money in, it's just a data point that you won't otherwise have. So I think just being mindful of what we're spending, not judging it, not beating up on ourselves if we're having difficulty, but just start with knowing because so many of us really have no idea, speaking for myself. And looking back on the last six months, what does that do? It, you know, that's not as helpful. So this is a, a very easy mindful spending plan that I'm happy to talk more about if you reach out to me. Another exercise I love to do, I actually brought the values cards up on my screen, but um, I won't go through it now. But I have cards with 14 different values, philanthropy, family, recreation, um, just a, each card has three values under. And so before we put this mindful spending plan in place, I just love to go through an exercise of asking people to identify what are your top three, four values? It's hard, I have people like tend to, no, it's like, no, I'm sorry, narrow it to three or four. And then look at you know your, your last credit card bill, look how you're spending. Not everything is gonna be correlated, of course, our lives aren't that neat. But if you really say that family is important, yet you're spending all your money on like your fancy car or not, and, and, you, and you don't have enough money for a good family vacation, Maybe, maybe that's not really your value or maybe you're spending your money inappropriately. Um, again, it's not for me to say everybody has different values, but it's, it's eye-opening um, to go through an exercise like that and see how you're spending. And then the last one is easy to say and not as easy to do, but notice the story you're telling yourself and ask if it's true. Um, this was so true for me. I mean, I, I, there was just no way I could ever be happy if I didn't live in the same house, have the same vacations, have the ability. To, I, I just sort of had convinced myself that my happiness was contingent on things and how, how wrong I was because I'm so much happier now than I was for the last, you know, 10 years before I made the shift. And this is one that I actually said to Leslie just before we started. This one, frankly, I'm still working on, which is when I first started this practice, this financial planning practice, I was the worst boss I ever had. But it was a need, I think, to prove to myself that I was successful. And if I wasn't like up at the crack of dawn and on email to 11 o'clock at night and scheduled to like, you know, to the life of each day, then I wasn't successful. And, um, you know, that's, that's my practice now to ask myself what, what thing that gives me joy am I doing daily and define that as success. Um, so there are a lot of stories we tell ourselves and it's important to ask ourselves if those stories are true. 
So if this is resonating with anyone or anyone has something to share. And so these I call life tips because these have been the practices that I put in place that have changed my life. So uh, as I said earlier, my journey started when I began to practice mindfulness. And I was such a, I'm a type A personality. So when I first started practicing yoga, I mean, it was Bikram yoga, if you guys know what that is, you know, 104 degree heat, sweating. And um, I'm a member of a synagogue. And there was a yoga teacher who came to my synagogue, she's going to teach Jewish yoga. And I thought, I'll show up once, but I'm not gonna, this is, I'm not gonna break a sweat. This woman changed my life. I'm, I'm gonna start, she really changed my life, made me aware again that I was choosing what to do each day. And so just sitting still for five minutes a day, two minutes a day, I think can really make a difference. And um, I'm not saying anything new by, by saying a gratefulness practice, a gratitude practice can also make a difference in your life because we, uh, we are hardwired to get up and notice what's wrong. Oh my God. I have to, and if you could just get up and say, wow, I, I turn the faucet and hot water comes out. I think about that every time I'm in the shower, that how much I take that for granted and, and what a privilege that is. We don't have to carry water or boil it. Um, so I, I try to at least name one thing a day that I'm grateful for. Um, nurture your relationships with others, with yourself and um, with trust and faith. I was in a large group coaching practice with um, financial advisors. So you could imagine a bunch of dudes and we would start our meetings um, with one of the coaches saying, what's your relationship with trust and faith? And that means something different for everyone. But if, as you undertake a journey of transformation of change, faith and trust plays a big role in that. And so just answer that question for yourself. Um, and finally, on this slide, make time for self-care, get enough sleep. I actually, one of the biggest gifts I gave myself this past year is I wake up at seven instead of six. I have difficulty getting to bed before 1130 midnight. And that has made such a big difference in my life. I'm actually awake. Um, I try to hydrate, move your body. If that means dancing around the room, eat well and um, and I've really come to recognize that understanding your finances is part and parcel of self-care and something that women, um, again, generalizing, uh, don't always do for themselves. And it's, it's important too. And I think this last, I've, I've been reading, David White is a well-known poet and he has a book where he really um, addresses the career world. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name, but I saw this quote and I said I had to include it. As we practice going inward, we come to realize it's a cry for something else sometimes that we hear. Often the physical bodies need for rest, for contemplation, for a kind of forgotten courage one difficult to hear, demanding not a raise, but another life. And this is me, but I like, I, I put this at the end because I do think as we go through transitions in our lives, it does take courage. Um, it comes, it, which comes from our heart, right? It's a Latin word meaning heart. So um, cultivate love may feel uncomfortable to say love for yourself, for your journey, for listening to what you need and, and for the others in our lives that will help us along on, on the journey, whether it's other women at Kobe Club, um, our family, our friends. So um, it takes courage to lead a brave life, but um, I know Leslie's story, I know mine, and it's, it's worth it. Thank you, Laura, thank you, that was, Amazing. I love, I love when financial people are not financial people the way that I think they, they usually are. I love it. That's fantastic. 
let me tell you guys what else is coming up um, tomorrow, which is Thursday at 2 p.m. How to double your business revenue in 2021. And that's with Jennifer Kim, who's just, she's amazing. She's a certified professional business life coach. And she's, she just, she's just got plans and ideas and ways to move you forward. She's just extraordinary. Positive mornings, you should come and give it, give a try. We have April is Share the Covey Love Month. So we're inviting everybody who buys a ticket to bring a friend with them. Or if you're already a member of Positive uh, Mornings, you can just let Marissa know who you wanna bring. And to each Positive Morning in April, you can bring a buddy with you, which we wanna share the love because that's one of our, our best um, events that we do. And those are at 9 a.m. Uh, Monday mornings, nine to 10, it's worth your time. Healing the Wounds of Not Enough, which is Wednesday, April 7th at 2 p.m. Uh, that's Paula Prentice, who's amazing. She's a professional life coach, licensed social worker, speaker. She also was a producer, a news producer. Um, and she's just amazing. She's come and spoken before with the Covey Club, so you can see her, what she's done before. Um, and then How to Get Through Menopause with Top Notch Style. That's Thursday, April 8th at 2 p.m. and that's Meg Matthews. It's two o'clock. She's a icon of the 90s British pop scene. <laughs> she wrote a book called, um, what is the name of the book? I don't see the name of the book here, but she's got a site which is called megsmenopause.com. So apparently she's very funny. So this should be fun for us to do. <laughs> so I hope you will all join us. And Laura, that was amazing. Thanks and, uh, for having me. That approach. And uh, thank you, everybody. Tammy, we're going to figure out what that through line is. We're going to bust. <laughs> That's my job for the next six months. We're going to figure that out because I know there's an answer there for sure. Thank you for joining us, guys. Donna, Marissa, will work with you. To I'm worried now. Like, is something wrong with the site? Yeah. Oh, right. You know. it, could, it could be user error. Please. Yeah, oh. you never know. You never know. Some coaching. Tech. Tech. <laughs> Tech is, you never know. Tech can all do kinds of crazy things. All right. Thank you, guys. Nice to see Thank you. Thank you all for contributing. So appreciated. Great. Laura, right. thanks. Have fun up there. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.